All right, my name is Paul Brabon. You're on the edge. I am sheltered in place. I am sitting here with my friends as only I can do it. Um, it's time for the 420 shout out with Patrick Carlin. Patrick, what are you doing, buddy? I'm staying away from everybody, and uh, that's cool. We're watching a lot of good TV and stuff, and uh, I don't know why these people act like staying home is being sentenced somewhere. Uh, I don't understand that, but that's everybody got their own way of looking at life. I'm just uh, doing my thing here and uh, not, you know, I'm just happy not to be in one of the people shoving stuff down my throat and all because my lungs are filling up with water. I don't want that. And uh, these people protesting in some of these states, it's amazing how you can whip everybody into a lather. Uh, we watched Network yesterday. That's my second favorite program. <laughs> yeah. a, a movie, yeah. That's yeah, my I do. I, we, we've talked about that. You know, the the primal uh, scream, right? Yeah, I mean to to just when, but to uh, to be able to uh, hit that button with the people, and you don't have to be saying anything that's even intelligent. You just have to be <clears throat> expressing anger. Anger cool. or fear, anger or fear or whatever, yeah. whatever propaganda you're trying to feed us. Yeah, the herd trip, man. Yeah, yeah, the herd. You know, you got the buffalo are all nice there, and they're all eating and having a good time, and then the clouds begin to turn dark over just northwest, and stuff blows in quick and pretty quick. All of a sudden, there's a nice rumble of thunder, and uh, they're all off and winging, man. <laughs> They're all off running like hell and trampling one another and anything that's in their way. And they don't know why. They don't know the sheep. When you take the sheep down, you tell them, go in the corral, and you go further down there, and then they'll cut your throat and make lamb chops out of you. And shit. They just can all move right along and stuff. Uh, that's that herb, that herd trip. And uh, you got to, you know, a lot of us are just born where that doesn't work. Uh, I consider that fortunate. Like when they get these little uh, piano dudes and they're three years old and they're playing Beethoven and stuff, you know. The prodigies, uh, the prodigies. Yeah. yeah. So we're, well, we're, 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 pro pro we're prodigies in another way is what you're saying. I was a pro yeah, I was a prodigy at being hip to the jive. Yeah, to the uh, bullshit. Yeah, catch it. Oh, come on. Yeah, man. Well, the I'm funny thing is I'm boy. looking at you right now. I'm looking, actually, we have a slideshow going of you and Right when you said that, you know, the picture with you wearing the shirt that says, fuck the rules came up. And I said, oh, yeah. okay. I think that's pretty much timing right there, sir. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm all for synchronicity. And, uh, oh, I have a lot of things like that happen. I put together sets every morning. I don't have, a, I don't have my, my trip in motion yet. But I had decided that after 87 years of being a total fucking dick, <laughs> and doing as little as possible to get by, you know, and just enjoying myself. And if a gig wasn't working out, going in at 8.31 in the morning and telling all the executives to go fuck themselves and to have my check ready by 10.30 or we'd have physical shit going on. And uh, all of that shit, man. I'm and telling so you, just, if they ever have to rewrite the Webster's Dictionary when they put the word motherfucker in it, they got to uh, have a picture of you, uh, sir. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful word. Uh, George and I used to use it as, as endearment and shit. Right. But, uh, hey, motherfucker. And I, I use it all the time, uh, just as a regular word and shit. But it is also, it's a very wonderful word uh, of, of letting a person know that you're not kidding anymore. Like when I wanted a guy to move his car. And uh, it was at a Pep Boys thing, and my car was blocked in. And uh, I wanted to get out, and it was a big Oldsmobile there and a bleach blonde lady sitting in the passenger seat. And I said, uh, can you uh, move that car so I can get my car out? And she said, see my husband in a real snotty manner. <laughs> So the husband was up on this platform ordering something from the guy at Pep Boys about tires or something. And I tapped him on the shoulder. And I said, uh, hey, uh, 
can you move your Oldsmobile so I can get out of here? And this fucking moron, this fucking halfwit said to me, when I'm ready. <laughs> Man. I, I just, that was no, I don't have to think of how I'm going to, shit just happens to me automatically. <laughs> I just was in his fucking face, screaming at the top of my voice, you're ready now, motherfucker. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh I, I say I say shit. It gets me in trouble all the time, Patrick. It's usually, it's usually usually if Christine throws me a glance, I'm getting better at this. You know, as as writers and comedians, we're told not to um, we're told not to um, 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 filter our responses or our comments. We're we're kind of told to go with the flow and, and, and get it out of us. And so absolutely, when somebody starts talking <laughs> shit, take a sip of something if you need to. Um, but oh, you know, I, I swallowed backwards and I got a piece of crust in my throat. I'm cool. All right, cool. Um, yeah. But, but I, I know that that's, that's one of those things is that sometimes if Christine's with me, she'll throw a glance at me and I'm getting better at, oh, okay, she knows what's about to come out of my mouth. And oh, she, okay. And she's trying yeah. to make sure that I don't go over she's the top. She's anticipating it. Good for her. Yeah, and then and then um, <laughs> the kids just look at me like, like, oh no, Dad's going to embarrass me again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Because oh, I just God, I yeah. speak my mind, and and if somebody's being a dick, I let them know you're being a dick. Oh. And yeah, if, and absolutely. If it's, a, if it's a little old lady. Or if it's little kids, I usually do it in such a manner that they still know what the hell I'm talking about without using the profanity. But oh yeah, uh, but I did but a nice one I to it. I did a nice one to a lady one time. I was I was driving along out in Westlake Boulevard, and there were all these people out there who got too much fucking money and shit like that. And, and uh, this fucking woman just come out of nowhere, never looked. Damn near made me wreck my fucking car. So I, I didn't know if it's a woman, a man, or whatever it is. I get around it, and I cut the motherfucker off in retaliation, because that's the way I drive. And so um, and now I retaliated, and I go, and I park. And uh, <laughs> this is very uh, in charge lady, very business, very superior lady, <laughs> walks up to me. And she says, you, sir, are a perfect asshole. <laughs> and I said, I said, and you're a dried up old cheese cunt, but what else is new? <laughs> so, so, so there you go. You know, <laughs> you should have, you should have been an umpire because you always call them as you see them. Oh, I do. I do, man. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's absolutely. good. That's good. It can, you know, because it kind of, you know, if people go out of the way to be shitheads. By the way, I know it's it's usually time for your morning jam. What do you want to listen to in the background while we're talking? Oh, uh, that's life by David Lee Roth. All right, that's life. <laughs> that's a Sinatra song by David Lee Roth, huh? Uh, yeah, man. That's the only guy I got it by. <laughs> Uh, let me see here. All right, we can do that. Here's a little bit of that. That's Life by David R Roth. And I'm going to play it right after this, guys. Uh, get rid of this commercial. You guys don't want to hear that. Nobody wants to hear a commercial. Here it is. All right, we got a little David Lee Roth going around in the background for you guys while I'm talking to Patrick. I hope you guys are enjoying your day. We started off this conversation talking about you reading... Uh, last words of your brothers oh that was fun i read it took me two days to read it and, and i did six hours the first day and six and a half hours the second day so a 12 and a half hour read now you felt yeah. you said you kind of felt like you almost channeled him at times oh at times at times i was well i was smoking my ass off the whole time <laughs> i was reading it well that's what and, i'm about uh, to do too because it's the 420 shout out for me so I'm yeah smoking. it was perfect and uh, it was right up my alleyway, and they they uh, they sent Elisa Shokoff from uh, uh, 
uh, what the hell is it, S and S there, Schreiber and uh, whoever the hell they are. Good people. And, Schumann, uh, Schumann, Talman, Schuster, whoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was like, a, she would, uh, George laid a little French thing in there. I didn't even know what the fuck that was, but I said it. And uh, with her coaching, I said it properly. <laughs> Raison d'etat or some... Raison d'etat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had a lot of fun reading what, it. What and does it was Raison d'etat mean? Because... I'm trying to remember. It means... Oh, I can't remember. I have no idea what it means because I don't give a fuck. But uh, <laughs> George took me out one night when we were like way back, 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 you know, long before he died. I mean, she was back when he was first freaking out and shit and we were... We were up in Topanga Canyon with uh, Spanky and uh, some of the people from Spanky and our gang and shit. And we'd been smoking good shit and listening to uh, Spooky Tooth. Uh, and, uh, you know, just having a nice time. And we come out, okay, of Topanga Canyon at night. And you're away from the city glare, so you could really see the... Uh, the uh, heavens, and I look up there, and George starts naming. He says, "There's the sisters, and there's the Baba Daba, and there's a." He named two guys that were like twins or some shit, and he named all the. He, look at this one, and oh, there's. Our, I said, "Oh Christ!" Huh? And he said, "Did you get all of that?" And I said, "Oh, that yeah, man, that was really something." He says, "Do you remember any of it?" And I said, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> I did but when I was like a trip to the planetarium, man. I mean, this fucking guy, he's uh, the smartest person I ever knew. And uh, and he would leave me alone because a, a, a lot of the shit that I'd be doing, uh, he approved of, you know, like it was as if he was doing it. So uh, we were we were really tight on uh, what we thought about shit. We'd be... We'd be at a party or some shit. We went to one of them parties uh, with, you know, all the hippies are there and shit. And right. This is back in like 1968 and 66 and shit like that. The year and before I, I was born and the year after I was born. There you go. So we were right around you, bro. <laughs> we were getting everything ready for you. Yeah, and uh, we go in this place. And we knew a little bit, everybody had books back then. What are you, a Capricorn? What are you, a this and shit? And we come to this party, and Marlene and I go in, and this lady's uh, got a star lady there who knows all the star shit. And she, she says, uh, what, what is your sign? And Marlene says, oh, he's a, he's a Lib Libra with Aries rising. And the fucking chick looks at me, and she said, you must have done something horrible in a past life. <laughs> oh, that's I fucking loved it. I fucking loved it, man. Because I never put much truck in that shit. Uh, it's nice how, how right they are on a lot of shit. Like I had Mars in, uh, I had Mars in Scorpio, and it said something about uh, combative or shit like that, and. Uh, you know, some of it rings pretty true. I had Venus was in the right place, you know, for horny motherfuckers. And uh, they, they had me pretty good on two or three traits of mine. Absolutely. But uh, meanwhile, I say I do what I want, you know. And uh, it works for me, Paul. That's good, man. I'm glad, man. I, I'm glad that we kind of live the life that we want. We don't hold back, right, Patrick? That's something I've learned from you in the last five plus years hanging out with you. It will save you a lot of grief. It will save you a lot of fucking grief. A lot of grief uh, gives you a better blood pressure rate, right? Drops your blood pressure. Uh, you can well, sleep a little bit better. my blood pressure's been fucked up since, since I was young. I had to lay down to get into the fucking Air Force. Right. Uh, to get my blood down and shit like that. I, I for some reason, uh, I had to take these little pills, you know. I'm what they call a high-risk motherfucker right now. Uh, oh, yeah, the, you're uh, in that group. You're in that group, right? So. I'm an old, I'm over 80. Old, old, you're getting old there, Patrick. Whatever, you're old, man. I love that shit. <laughs> if you ain't old, you're fucking dead. So, uh, you know, the choice is yours, Jack. That's uh, it. I, I'm starting to embrace it a little bit. I'm starting to embrace it. I was I was dragging my feet, my man. Yeah. I know I feel I'm still young, but 
I, I was starting to feel really old, but like I said, hanging out with you kind of makes me kick the blues, too. Oh, yeah, that's a gift. It's yeah. a gift to uh, to crank them years out uh, because that's all it's about. I and mean, I'm reading, you know, I always look at shit by famous guys, and I forget who the fuck they are, but they say a lot of good shit. <laughs> and what do they do? Uh, one guy said, uh, life is memories. And that, that's all the fuck it is. When I go to bed at night, people want to know how to go to sleep. I'll tell you how to go to sleep. Number one, be tired. Be right. fucking tired. Be so put in a good day's, day's work. Off. Put in a good I mean, day's work even if you're at home. Yeah. Then go into your fucking bedroom without gadgets and shit with you. No fucking gadgets. You're in the fucking bedroom to sleep. Lay down in the bed. Get yourself comfortable. And then you say, it's black. Open your eyes because it's totally black in the fucking room. You say it's black, it's quiet, I'm warm. Oh, I remember when we were living on 140th Street and I was nine years old and we went up to steal candy from the five and ten. Yeah, boy, that was a fun afternoon and it was hot. And the next thing I know, I've slipped into a small chapter of the adventures of Patrick. And I've been so many, you know, kicked out of second grade, or off to boarding school back here, hitching on the back of trucks, stealing, being able to outrun people, uh, dumb shit, learning to dance the mambo with Puerto Rican chicks, all different kinds of chapters, man, in my life. And uh, I like them. So I can slip up any chapter I want. Oh, let's be let's be five years old and go to Harlem with Leon and listen to fucking uh, Billy Holiday sing "Pennies from Heaven" out of one of those speakers coming out of a radio store. That's shit that you see in movies, man. And I was actually there doing it. So uh, if I if I wanted to be pissed off about being old, I'd be a real ungrateful asshole. Right. Exactly. Now speaking about being grateful for being alive. I know that we're on the eighth anniversary of Levon Helms passing. Yeah, I said goodbye to Levon on the on the uh, on the Woodstock Roundtable this morning. Doug Grunter, uh, they had. I've been phoning in because you know uh, what the hell, stay home tripper. Right. And I called in, and when I finished it up, I gave uh, reference to that fact, and I uh, I spoke of the thing that he's got a great song. When I go away. And George and I, and I explained it to Levi one time, and he got a big laugh out of it. George would call and he'd say, oh, man, Jimmy Brown went away today. And we would call it going away. Right. When you died. We didn't say pass on, he went away. So I, I explained to Levon about that, too. When I heard that song, I said, oh, Levon, I said, that's what me and George used to do, you know. Uh, say, I went away when I go away. So then I went up and I said hi to him uh, today up in his grave, leave on. And, uh, it, you know, he was a good pal for, for yeah. three years. And, yeah, he yeah. was good. To, he was good to you and George, right? So, Well, he was into George. Yeah. And that was when George died in 08. Then I hear from his manager, Barbara O'Brien, and she said, Levon would like you to come to a ramble. Now, I dug the band because that little, uh, that little uh, young kid said I managed uh, back in 69 what to was 72. Free? Free, I want to say. Uh, that was uh, Saratoga. Saratoga. And those were the kids that used to back Big Joe Turner once a month up at the Topanga Corral. And they were in the rotation for, for, for bands along with Taj Mahal and uh, Nils Lofgren and Little Feet, and uh, they were right in the rotation with them. And they would back Big Joe Turner for they would do their thing and then do him uh, back him for a set. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful era. And uh, it was like '69 to '72, and uh, the, the music was there and the people were there, and uh, it was real. It was fucking real, man. I loved it. Well, check this out. While we're talking for a minute, and I'm getting my smoke on, and I don't have to sit here and show everybody what I'm doing, I'm going to play a little bit of Levon Helm from Electric Dirt, and guess what? It's When I Go. How about that? Oh, yeah. All right, so here's a little bit of When I Go, 
And um, I want to know how you want to be remembered when you go. Uh, uh, I want you to. I want of, you to perform your of, own. He had eulogy. a lot of fun. He had a lot of fun, and he never gave a shit. <laughs> is that is that your part of your eulogy for yourself? That would be it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think everybody has their own way, whatever way they want to go and whatever they want uh, to yeah. remember. I say, I, I got things I live by, like, I never fucked a chick who didn't want to get laid, and I never sent anyone to the emergency room who didn't have it coming. Well, there you go. How's that? That's, How's that's, that? That is good, because you've, been, <laughs> you've gotten yourself hurt a few times. And that was your own fault, but that was back in the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so how was it when you first met Levon Helm? I mean, his manager called you. Well, it was instant rapport. He, uh, uh, I, I got invited to that ramble, like I said. And I brought a copy of Highway 23 for him, and I brought a copy for Barbara. And, uh... When the show was over, I was, Imus was there with his wife and his son, Wyatt. And so I was sitting, there was Imus in the front row with his wife and then Wyatt, and then I was next to the, next to Wyatt. And uh, we were right near the drum kit. So uh, we were, we had a wonderful time. And then when the thing was over, uh, Levon said good night and all, you know, to Imus and Imus, but people, and he left. And then Levon said, uh, you want to talk? I said, yeah, man, what do you got? And he started cutting up these big buds with a big scissor and rolling. And we just started shooting the shit. Uh, and it was like we knew each other forever. It was like we already had known each other. I can't explain how the fuck it is. Well. You know, it's kind of like when you get shipped out of one outfit for being an asshole and hanging out with assholes, and you go to the next outfit, and two days later, you're in with a whole new group of assholes, like the assholes that you left, right. who you were hanging out with before. And it did, you didn't put an ad in the bulletin board, you know, where do I hang out with the assholes? You guys just gravitate toward each other. And, and Levon and me were both... He used to do shit racing the, the tractor and shit like that, and he knew how to work. He knew real work, and I knew real work. I always had a gig when I was a kid. And w one of my jobs when I was 14 was uh, working for a superintendent of three apartment buildings, and I would mop from the sixth floor down to the lobby, mop them all. Me and his two nephews from Puerto Rico, we would stoke the fucking furnaces with coal, pull the dumb waiters, haul out the government. I mean, we, we fucking knew what a, what a job of work was. You know, when I worked for a meat market, I had to work besides doing delivery. So Levon had worked hard because his dad, you know, ran cotton stuff uh, and and had piece of ground that he worked on. And Levon picked cotton. Levon worked it. And Levon knew that uh, when he could play music, that was a better thing for him to be doing. But he knew the real life, and he knew the real people, and he loved people, and he was just a real fucking, a perfect person uh, to, you know, uh, for me, and my kind of guy. So we uh, we had a lot of good sessions talking about Jesse James and helping the farmers and taking away from the railroads. He was a worker, you know. He's got a song called Mountain. Uh, where, about how they take and take everything away in West Virginia and Kentucky, you know, and, and just leave you with the land that you can't even drink the water. And it's a real touching song about the mountain. And uh, Levon was, I still talk to his spirit just like George's when I do these sets in the morning. I mean, and then he's got lyrics in some of his songs like in Ophelia. Why do the good things always disappear? Isn't that a beautiful lyric? It is. Um, yeah. And it, so he was a he was a very heavy influence. I only knew him for three years, but they were they were really great years for me. And I found out a lot about music and shit that uh, 
uh, he liked the idea that I didn't play any instruments or nothing like that. <laughs> I'd say, Jesus Christ, all I can do is listen. I said, I got to tell you that uh, I sure do love listening. I said, I got to be honest with you. I said, I like Jerry uh, Jerry Lewis and, and the Playboys on a tune they do. And he said, well, you ought to. He said, you got guys playing there like Levon Russell and shit. And, uh, you know, because a lot of the a lot of the little bands and the singers would have the these people called the Reckon Crew, real great musicians uh, doing all the all the music licks and shit. So uh, we we just had a wonderful time and we really we really smoked a lot of reefer together. I'll tell you that. And uh, well, it's funny because I'm looking some... at the cover for which I'll share with everybody right now, really quick. Um, hold on, let me share this here. Um, this is the cover which we were just looking at for uh, Dirt Farmer for Electric Dirt, and so Electric. Oh yeah. So Electric Dirt looks like he's going up to the hills. He's going up to the hill. Yeah. There's the farm up on top of the hill with the corn on one side, and it looks like some other green stuff on the other side, and who knows what's Cotton, going on. Probably, there. yeah. And so you know, he was definitely. He never forgot his roots. Uh, oh no, and it, yeah, you can tell he's not one of those guys. Even when when he was, you know, when the band was at their top, they were definitely not. He was definitely not one of those uh, city slickers that would go and no, live, in, no. live in L.A. and could have stand stood L.A. Right? Yeah, so, he just did his thing his way, right. wherever he was, and it was wonderful. And then he did things in films like Coal Miner's Daughter and a couple of other great films and shit he did where he was just the right guy. And right. Uh, he, he, uh, he had a wonderful time. And his wife, Sandy, told me that uh, his, one of his thoughts was, you know, when they say on a, on a stone, 1940-2012 or something, that little dash in between, she said, that's life. <laughs> Isn't that something? That yeah. is something that's very poignant. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so we still see her. She's a good pal with my wife Marlene, and uh, they like the African violets and this and that. And she's she's a good lady, and uh, yeah, he was was just a wonderful pal. And I'm like it's funny because I I dug the band. I got into them off of uh, the lead guitar player. I liked them. So I liked what they did, and then George sent me everything from the last wall. So I was into the band, right? And uh, but not into Levon as just a person. I knew he was part of the band. I knew that he sang the the, the real good tunes that I liked, and uh, and he and he, even then, the, and he was the r literal backbone to the band. He was the drummer, and so he was the main scene. Yeah, as far as I was concerned, because it always starts with the drummer for me. Right. Even in the and even then, the beginning of songs, right? They hit the sticks and they go click, click one, two, and three, that was it. boom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's driving that train. Right. <laughs> yeah. All the rest is nice. It's a cocktail lounge and shit like that with the <laughs> guitars and everything. But the drummer driving that train, man. And uh, yeah, and my first uh, my first experience was watching the last waltz. Yeah, because the last oh, waltz yeah. was just the the the. That was the the it film when it came to um, music concerts on yeah. film at that point. I mean that. Oh yeah, that uh, definitely things that proceeded after that were the things that you remember too but this is the oh, one that yeah. really kind of set the the watermark if you will and oh yeah but, but yeah when, but when you not only had too, the, he... who else did you have you had not only the band you had neil young you had i'm trying to remember who else was in the band there was like there was multiple people i want to say bonnie Raitt. i should go look really quick um the last waltz contained uh da 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 da, da. Um, oh, Van Morrison was in the, there with them. The cast of The Last Waltz was... Yeah. Um, let me see here. Well, of course, Robbie Robertson from the band. He was the lead singer. Martin Scorsese, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Van Morrison, Joni Mitchell, Muddy Waters, your buddy, yeah. Yvonne Helm, Eric Clapton. Um, I'm going through a couple names I don't know. Neil Diamond, Dr. John, 
Emmy Lou Harris, Ringo Starr. Yeah, I remember Ringo Starr and Ronnie Wood. Everybody remembers Ronnie Wood being there too. Um, hot pop staples from the staple singers, right? Paul yeah, Butterfield. Everyone. Boy, everybody was there. This is the concert film that happened in 1978, hour and 57 minutes. If you guys haven't checked it out, you have to check it out. Here's a little quick uh, just synopsis of it. 17 years after joining forces as the backing band for the rockabilly cult hero, Ronnie Hawkins, Canadian Roots, Rockers, the band called it quits with this lavish farewell show at San Francisco's Winterland Ballroom on November 25th, 1976. Filmed by Martin Scorsese, this documentary features standout performances by everybody I just mentioned. Uh, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, Clapton, Mitchell, Waters, you got it. Um, as well as interviews tracing the group's history and discussing the road life. Um, so if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Heck, you can buy it for $2.99. You can own it for like $10.99 or something. So you yeah, guys, uh, you guys had no excuse. Now you can get you can get a book by Levon Helm called This Wheels on Fire. And I have got shit underlined on almost every page of that book. And you <laughs> want to know something funny? What's that? Uh, Jerry lined up a thing for me to be on Imus so I oh, could cool. pimp Highway 23. Right. And I'm on the Imus show, and I got started talking about... Uh, this wheel's on fire. So I, I, come back, uh, I come back to a ramble uh, a few days later uh, on the weekend, and one of the guys who works with Levon says, hey, thanks for what you did there. I said, what was that? He said, uh, when uh, you got off of Imus, he said, uh, the next day, uh, this wheel's on fire went to number one on rock biographies. <laughs> I talked so much about Levon's book that uh, it hyped the sales uh, on Imus. So that was, I didn't even mean to do that. And it, it just happened. A lot of shit happens just the right way if you leave shit alone. Right. Uh, forced stuff is not good. Forcing shit is not good. Uh, you know, no, it has to happen uh, naturally. It all has to just happen naturally. Um, uh, yeah, man. Otherwise, I can't handle it. You know, it, it, ain't, it ain't right for me. It's contrived. It's something. contrived bullshit, yeah. right? So. Yeah, yeah. They give me shit to read, and that's fine, because all I ever use it for is like uh, to glance at, because uh, I, I, that's just ain't, ain't what's coming out. So fuck it, and. Uh, there you go. And like if you're a boss, like I told my buddy this morning, I ran into one of my buddies up there at Levon's grave. And I said, I could be a CEO. I could be a CEO of any big company in this fucking country right now and, and make the motherfucker, if they're having trouble with it and shit, and I could go in and straighten it out real quick. But they wouldn't fucking like me. But, right. uh, but I, you just go to where you go to when you say, Who's running this thing? Who's running this ship? What do you do? What do you like? How do you know? Here's what I need. You guys find out how to work it out. You don't go in there and tell the motherfucker how to change a tire. That's his fucking gig. <laughs> That's his fucking gig. Right. You say, we got to find a way. We got to work out a way where we got these five trucks here. We got to have, by Friday, we need them all with fucking tires rotated and around. And however you guys do it, that's fine with me. Do it the way that's best for you. I need this shit by Friday. Is that a doable thing? And you can do that with any department. You do it with every fucking department. Leave the fucking workers the fuck alone. The people who get the best work out of me. I've had jobs where people left me alone. Uh -huh. When me and Marlene ran the kitchen for those rich kids going wrong in Vermont and shit, that man never questioned our shit a bit. Never questioned our shit a bit. Well, and because, that's, you know, that's I was, how you work, too. I was being can... fair to the kids, and I was listening to the kids, and I, they quit breaking in the kitchen two days after we went on the job. I said they, they had the kitchen that had been an enemy, and I made the kitchen a fucking friend. I had guys volunteering for fucking KP and shit. So uh, it's how you fucking do things. If you want the break room cleaned up and you're in the fucking Air Force or the Army, and you come in and say, 
All right, Collins and Dawson, you will clean that fucking break room up right now. Get the fuck out of my face, you asshole. You're going to get a slipshod job that I don't really fucking give a shit if you like or not. But you'll see that it's been done. But if you come in that same room and you say to me, hey, Patrick and Dodd, uh, Dodd, uh, uh, I got a fucking chicken shit colonel coming in here today. Uh, you guys do a pretty good job on this fucking break room for me and keep this prick off my ass. You'll get a fucking beautiful day room. Am I nuts? No, no, no. Not at all. Matter of fact, not, how you, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's how you present shit. No, it is. And and matter of fact, I, I totally get that. I'm I'm at that point right now where it's it's all in how you serve it up and you can see the bullshit coming a mile away matter yeah. of fact seeing bullshit coming a mile away guys i have to cut we it's that time we've already we've already ran through our time patrick i want to thank you for hanging out with us i know after this segment i'm going to play uh ophelia from the last waltz um, oh thank you man and let me tell you unlike my my good friend of uh of network there howard beale I will never run out of bullshit. <laughs> there he is. Patrick Carlin, everybody. Get his books. Quinn's Bar and Grill. Kian fucking Sabe. As well as Highway 23 on Amazon Books. Today. Download it. Quinn's Bar and Grill. You got to check it out. It's his newest one. $4.99 for the download. And you just got to check it out. Um, thanks again, Patrick. We'll see you next time on uh, the 420 My pleasure. Channel. 